But I've got some very exciting people for you now to talk about technology. So um, as Susie very kindly introduced, I'm Dr. Jackie Bell, and I had the absolute pleasure of being patron for this technology and space session as part of Mars Day. And as someone who one day dreams to become an astronaut and perhaps get to explore Mars in person, it is extremely exciting for me to have such amazing experts on today's panel. As a scientist, mathematician and previous particle physicist, I'm interested in finding out more about the technology that drives space exploration, whether that be robotically or involving humans. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists. So I'm going to begin with Dr. Steve Bannum, a UK Space Agency Research Fellow and Postdoctoral Research Associate at Imperial College London. Steve, are you there? Because Hello, good there. afternoon. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're currently working on. Yeah, so I'm a UK Space Agency Research Fellow and I'm a, par a participant on the uh, Curiosity mission and also ESA's um, ExoMars mission. And my role is to sort of look at the, the rocks and understand what the depositional environment is and try and figure out uh, whether the environment that the, the rover's traversing across uh, would have been uh, habitable at some point in Mars's past. So the, the problem is, is that uh, a planet's history is written in stone and by look, and basically essentially looking at the rocks is the only way we can figure out what Mars was like uh, back in its ancient past sort of three and three, sorry, 3.5 billion years ago and older where we think um, life was sort of where, where life could have existed. So we have to look into the rocks and uh, try and determine whether the environment uh, that deposited the rocks was habitable and and then try and figure out whether there could be some sort of biosignatures preserved in those rocks, be those organic molecules or, or physical uh, sort of expressions of, of life. And I'm heavily involved with that uh, on, the, um, on the Curiosity rover. And then I'm sort of helping plan uh, how we're going to image the rocks when uh, the ExoMars rover arrives at, um, at uh, Oxyoplanum. Amazing. So links on really well from the last panel, actually, we were discussing the science um, on Mars. Um, and I'm sure that there'll be some exciting things coming back for you to analyze. So um, just to in continue introducing our panelists, uh, we also have Sarah Batagian, um, space and planetary science PhD researcher based in the Natural History Museum and also works at Imperial College. So Sarah, uh, please tell us about yourself and your research. Hi, so like Jackie said, I'm a space and plant design PhD student and I actually work um, majority on the ExoMars mission or some of the instruments that are on board the ExoMars mission. Um, most instruments I work with are spectral instruments, so that means that they look at the way light interacts with matter to help us understand the surface. So the kind of end result of the stuff I do is that Steve gets to look at it and figure out what we have on Mars and why that's interesting and where we should go next. Um, and that's important for a few different reasons. So we're actually building a list of protocols and um, software to analyze the data that comes back to, back from Mars on the ExoMars mission in a really short time scale because during the mission we have a really short period in which we're actually able to analyze the data before the plan for the next sol has to happen and if you miss that window if you miss re-uploading the plan for the next sol the rover just sits there for an entire day so the kind of role of my work is to expedite the analysis on these tactical timelines to make sure people like Steve have all the information they can to create the plan for the next sol. Wow. So again, a lot of responsibility to kind of get it right and get things done in the time that you've got um, allocated. Um, and last, but by no means least, we have Group Captain Andy Cooksley, Future Communications and Digital Systems Lead with the Royal Air Force. So Andy, please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your career journey and your work so far. Hi, Jackie. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, a Royal Air Force engineering officer. Uh, I to complete the sort of Imperial College connection, my first degree was in physics from, from Imperial a while ago now. Uh, and I've been working in communications and IT systems for the Royal Air Force ever since. Now, we haven't quite got to Mars yet, so I'm, I'm sort of uh, still stuck in Earth orbit uh, compared to the colleagues on, on the panel. But uh, yeah, that, that's been really important for, for the military for a long time now. We use satellites for communication. We use satellites for reconnaissance to tell us uh, what's, what's out there. And obviously, you know, GPS positioning is, is absolutely critical to a lot of our operations. And I've been working on uh, some of our satellite systems, bringing them into service. I've also uh, been on the far end of, of those same satellite links in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and, and using them. 
So, and part of my job today is is absolutely concerned with future satellite capabilities. Uh, we're about to launch the sixth generation of the the military Skynet satellite communication system. I'm working on that. I work uh, in partnership with the UK Space Agency on uh, Earth orbit tracking uh, and management of, of satellites so that we know what's up there, and uh, looking further afield at, at novel small satellites type activities, as was talked about in the, uh, the previous panel. So we've been doing some work on how we can use those small satellites for, for, chip, for much cheaper and faster reconnaissance work. Brilliant. And, you know, all of these satellite communications are really important, especially now for everyone working remotely, keeping everyone in touch, working collaboratively with different countries. Um, so you probably know, as an RAF communications engineer, a lot more about satellites than I do. Um, but, you know, you mentioned how important it is for Earth and how you're, you're mostly involved with the stuff that's happening here on Earth. But would it one day be possible to adapt this technology and have similar systems in orbit around Mars, do you think? And um, what would be the, some of the technological challenges that, involve, that would be involved in adapting those systems for the likes of Mars? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, some of the previous panels have covered just, just how many spacecraft there are around Mars already. And some of them are doing very similar jobs. So we're taking pictures of the Martian surface from orbit and that's exactly what we use for you know, reconnaissance satellites around the, the Earth. Um, I think as you get more and more satellites there, then having some kind of communications grid for Mars is going to be, um, is going to be quite useful. And it's something Elon Musk talks about occasionally. So we can take some of the technologies we use uh, and shift them into Martian orbit. Uh, and maybe when we start talking about people being there and we want to know where the people are, want to know where the, the, uh, the robots are, then maybe in even some kind of positioning grid. So the kind of ideas are probably easily transferable, but the, the engineering challenge is, is a bit difficult. Um, the previous, some of the previous interviews have talked about just how long it takes to get to Mars. You know, six months if you go for the, the short version, you can only do that every two years. Um, it takes a lot more rocket energy to get to Mars than it does to get into low Earth orbit. So the challenges of getting something there of making sure it arrives in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, even NASA has got that wrong on previous launches, uh, are much bigger. So they're, they're nothing, I don't think there's anything groundbreaking, nothing engineering that we haven't developed yet, but it's engineering challenges that are orders of magnitude more difficult and everything's so much further away and the time delays and all the rest of it. So, so you've got to think really carefully about the resilience and the robustness of what you launch because you can't just... Uh, do the kind of thing Hina was talking about in the previous panel and say, oh, don't worry, we'll piggyback on the next launch and we can have replacement in orbit in a couple of days. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about the engineering challenges in the panel after mine. Um, but yeah, it's great to, to kind of see that the technology exists and that, you know, we, we're kind of ready to go and it mainly did, um, depends on, you know, the costs and the, the timing and getting everything right. And I think, you know, there are loads of people, you know, you mentioned Elon Musk as one of them who are looking to set up base on Mars. So I guess, do you, do you see this realistically being something that can happen, you know, in the next 10 years or will it be more like 50 years or 100 years? What, what, what's your estimation? Um, I, I, next 10 would be massively impressive. Um, I, I, Tim Peake talked about this quite early on in, the, in today's sessions. Uh, I, I think I'm with him, probably not the next 10 years. Within the next 20, I'd, I'd, I'd put a good bet on it. Um, I think yeah, if, it isn't, if it isn't one of the big national space agencies, then uh, yeah, the, the progress that SpaceX has made since it started, I wouldn't put it past him to have people on Mars in that sort of 10 to 20 year time frame. Let's see. So it's definitely within our, our lifetime and any young people watching, it could be missions that you're working on as scientists, technicians, engineers. Um, so, Sarah, um, you've been working with some of the instruments for the upcoming ExoMars mission that you just briefly mentioned. So ExoMars is a mission that will be searching for signs of life on the red planet. Um, tell us a little bit about your favourite instruments on board that ExoMars rover. This is a pretty difficult question to answer because they all do like quite distinct things and, and they're all really, really useful. Um, but loyally, I think I'm going to have to say PamCam 
So PANCAM is like the primary mode of image of scientific imaging for the entire mission. So it's not just because I work on it, but it's the first port of call for all of the kind of understanding and all the analysis we do in the surface before we get to do things like drilling two meters into the surface, which are like the kind of key, really interesting things we get to do with this mission. Um, so like I said, all the instruments I, I work on use the way light interacts with matter to help us understand the surface. So the, the great thing about PANCAM is you get these squiggly lines out that give us this diagnostic information about the material, but it's also placed within the context of an actual image. So you can look at the image of the surface and extract the spectra from spatial parts that you're interested in. Whereas spectrometers that don't have this kind of like sensor and filter real system only give you the spectrum back over kind of like an average point, which is so great and really, really helpful, but you lose that contextual information that's really important. Um, PanPan gives you slightly lower resolution spectral data, but it gives you all that really rich information along with it. And that's really important when you're trying to understand a planet that you can't stand on yourself. Um, so that's why I think PanCam is probably my favorite. But there are lots of really interesting ones from ExoMars and also like Curiosity and Perseverance as well. So it's hard. <laughs> Sorry to put that hard question on you there. Um, and it's really cool that you mentioned PanCam as well. So I was working on a project last year, uh, which involved me doing some research on the PanCam. And I just thought it was really cool. You know, you say we can't quite stand on the planet ourselves. And the position of that PanCam is really important to give us an accurate representation of what our, of what our eyes would see, you know, not being too low, not being too high and giving us an accurate representation of what the landscape on Mars is like. Absolutely. So um, Sarah and Steve, a question for, for the two of you then. Um, what are the key technological differences between the rovers that are already on Mars, um, such as Curiosity and more recently Perseverance, and the new um, ExoMars or Rosalind Franklin rover? So there's quite a lot of like kind of technological differences, like they use different power sources and things like that. They're built differently, they're different kind of shapes, but they're all kind of fundamentally looking or doing slightly different things all in the name of searching for life but they're not they're not really doing the same so i think curiosity's mission statement was follow the water so it's looking for environments that had water um perseverance is going to be our sample caching um ro rover that is going to cache samples on the surface of mars to be returned to earth at some point in the next about 20 years which is awesome um and pancam's kind of not pancam sorry ExoMars's main like separation from that is it's going to be looking into the subsurface of mars so we know that Mars has really high radiation levels and we know that that's really destructive to any biological life, but it's also really destructive to the evidence, like past evidence of um, life. So we're hoping that we can kind of get below that really harsh radiation barrier to find those signs if they ever existed um, and if they still exist today. Great, thank you. Um, and Steve, what, what are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, it's pretty much mirrors uh, what Sarah said. Um, Exo, sorry, um, MSL was uh, specifically designed to do in situ analysis of the, the rocks that it sampled. So it's able to sort of drill about five centimetres down into the surface and take a, a sample out and then do um, chemical analysis. Uh, in, in, so it can either look for organic molecules in situ, sort of your carbons and oxygen molecules, or, and it can also do analysis of the minerals as well in situ. Um, the Perseverance rover is designed to uh, cache the rocks uh, ready, for, ready for return. It can actually do uh, some uh, in situ analysis of the rock minerals. So it's got a instrument called Pixel on it, uh, which is a, a portable XRF unit. Basically it fires X-rays at the, at the rocks in a, in a grid pattern. The, the, the instrument sort of does a little zigzag across the surface and it can actually measure the um, measure what minerals are present in a sample before you decide to drill it or not. So that that instrument essentially does what the uh, the chemin instrument in Curiosity does. So that that's quite a neat advance because you don't have to drill a hole, take two or three days to drill the hole, and then use a, a expensive or or or, or sort of limited uh, rover resources to do the chemical analysis within the rover. Within three hours, you can sort of look at a rock, decide whether it's got the minerals you want, and then then move on. Uh, and then, as, um, as Sarah said, the ExoMars mission, that's also geared to in situ analysis, uh, but it's sampling from deeper beneath the surface uh, where other rovers haven't been able to to sample and that's going to be the game changer because we're going to be able to look look for sample organic molecules which haven't been destroyed by um, cosmic bombardment uh, from from solar and cosmic radiation wow 
And, and so how long does it take for this data then, you know, once they've collected these samples or analysed these samples, how long does it take for that data to, to get back to Earth? Uh, to get back from Earth. So the architecture of um, missions is really complicated. So there was the mention of um, it sort of taking the command uh, anywhere between about four minutes when Earth and Mars are close together uh, through to about 20 minutes when um, Earth and Mars are near a, a conjunction of sort of the opposite sides of the sun. Um, but then it's also not that simple as well, because to send a, a command or a series of commands to a rover on the surface, the, the planet has to be sort of in direct alignment uh, with Earth. So you can actually send the signal directly from Earth to the rover. You're not able to command the rover uh, using satellites. And then as soon as Mars rotates, that's it for the rest of the day. You can't send any more commands. However, you can return data from Mars using the satellite communications arrays. So normally what happens is, is once a Curiosity has performed its um, tasks, uh, it will signal the data up to one of the um, Mars orbiters, sort of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or the Trace Gas Orbiter or Marvin uh, or one of the other couples, couple of um, satellites that are there. And then because the, the satellite's in orbit, it can transmit for about two thirds of its orbit back to the NASA deep space, um, to, back to the deep space um, um, array of, of, of um, satellite dishes. Uh, and getting the data back just depends on the orbits of the satellite. So sometimes you have really favorable um, overpasses of the satellites and you can get sort of a gigabyte of data back. Doesn't sound like much, but you, that's quite a few photographs and quite a, quite, quite a bit of chemical data that you can get. But sometimes if the, the satellite just pops over the um, horizon, um, it might only be in view of the Curiosity rover for maybe five or 10 minutes and you might only get a couple of megabytes back. Um, and some days that's all you'll get. So yeah, some, some days you can get gigabytes and gigabytes of data back and you can do lots of science. And then other days you might just get a few megabytes back and, and you just have to put your hands in your pockets and for that day and do some other work instead. <laughs> it reminds me uh, very much of my PhD days in particle physics where I'd have to run um, simulations um, and models and kind of wait in the background for the data to be done. And sometimes it would take, you know, a couple of days, sometimes it would take a week or so. Um, and yeah, and as, as you've said, Steve, you would be kind of waiting for that for that moment to kind of move on with your research. But it's quite encouraging to know that, you know, once this data goes to those satellites, it can come back quicker, you know, depends on, depends on where things are. Um, and again, it must lead to some some anxiety when, you know, there's kind of a big discovery on the horizon. And you just have to wait that extra day or two to find out a bit more. Yeah, we, we've been suffering this with the uh, Mount Marku uh, target. So Curiosity is currently parked next to this mountain called, uh, well, this this hill called Mount Marku, which is about six metres high. It's the biggest cliff we've encountered and it's absolutely stunning. And we're sort of sat there waiting for the data to come down. And some, some days it comes down sort of early in the day. Uh, and other times um, where, where we've had the unfavourable overpasses, it's been been quite a while. So, so we've all been sort of holding our breath, waiting for this data to come back. And sometimes half a mosaic will come down and sometimes the whole thing will come down. So, so it, it's, it's quite, quite exciting. It sounds very exciting, it really does. Um, I'm gonna move back to Andy because um, I've, I've heard there are some big changes um, in the way of how the RAF uses space. So do you wanna tell us a little bit more about those changes on the horizon? Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, uh, to be honest, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of what I'm going to say was was actually covered in the previous section as well. But, but this is a really exciting time to be involved in space in the UK. Um, you know, Hina from Aspire talked about the idea of launching from the UK rather than from these sort of way, far off parts of the world. And um, yeah, you know, Scotland for for rocket launch, um, Cornwall as as a horizontal launch site. Uh, and sort of Cornwall space is really up and running now. Uh, and in fact, Virgin, um, the, the Virgin Group have been flying uh, converted jumbo jet 747 aircraft and launching rockets from underneath its wing up into space. Uh, and the RAF has been involved in that. We have a pilot embedded in that launch program. So a lot more to come, I think, in terms of the UK use of space, launching from the UK, 
Uh, a lot more investment in those small satellite technologies. It gives us that rapid turnover of technology that, that Hina was talking about. And actually, you know, I, was, I was listening to Steve talking about it, you know, your satellite orbits don't line up properly and, and you miss an opportunity. And that's a problem for Earth as well, especially with the really big satellites, which are expensive. We don't have too many of them. And those small satellites are a really great way of filling in the gap. So I think there's going to be quite a lot of stuff happening UK Space Agency, it's a big thriving industry. Uh, and for the RAF, you know, we want to make sure that we exploit that as well. And you're right, you can just kind of go to space. I've seen them and they just throw out all of these little tiny satellites as well. They're so, so small these days and they, they can do so much, uh, which is great. And the, the launches from the UK, I think, are going to be, um, you know, exciting for everyone involved or those of us who will be watching. Um, so I'm going to move to some questions that we've had in the chat. Uh, we've had a few questions about life on Mars. Um, I think I'll aim this um, at Steve um, and Sarah um, as planetary scientists. So we've been asked whether um, ozone layers can be found on other planets and whether this Mars has life or signs of water. Uh, in terms of ozone layer, I don't think Mars will be able to have an ozone layer. So you'd need a lot of free oxygen in the atmosphere. And ozone is formed by um, lightning electrical discharge in the atmosphere, which breaks down uh, the, the, the two oxygen molecules and allows um, an O3 um, molecule to form. I don't think there's enough oxygen in Mars's atmosphere. There's, there's virtually no oxygen in Mars's atmosphere. So I don't think that process will be able to happen. Also, I don't think there's any electrical discharges or anything like that in the atmosphere, although there are uh, clouds um, that do form in, in Mars's atmosphere. And so would this well, I, be the same? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Sarah, go on. Um, I think they have actually, they found like small amounts of ozone, but there isn't enough to have like a layer on Mars. But there's no like any planet could have one if it had the right ingredients. It's just that the ones that we're trying to get to right now don't, unfortunately. Sure. Um, and so um, perhaps this is a question for the next panel, but we've also been asked uh, what sort of metal the robots on Mars are made out of. Um, if anyone would like to answer that. Uh, a mixture of aluminium and titanium. Uh, well, the, the Curiosity and Perseverance rover are made out of aluminium and uh, titanium. Uh, amusingly, the suspension of um, Curiosity was made by a bicycle company uh, who specialise in welding titanium. So, so that, that's quite exciting. But the ExoMars rover, its bathtub, sort of the chassis, it's made of carbon fibre. So lots of space, space age materials. <laughs> Wow, I love those little facts, like a bicycle company, like that's so cool. It reminds me of like um, when it was women who made the Apollo space suits originally. And it, um, it was um, a company that makes women's underwear, particularly that won um, the, uh, what's it called? Uh, basically the contract. Yeah. Um, yeah, to make them. And so I love little facts like that. That's, yeah. that's it brilliant. It, it was the same with the guidance computer. The memory in the, the guidance computer for the Apollo missions was uh, sort of sewn in. Uh, it was sort of hardwired by people who were, by, by women who were really good at sewing. So they actually got specifically got people uh, who would work with looms to program the memory in the computer. Wow, it's brilliant. It, it just links back to what Susie was saying before. You know, you can work in the space industry, but not, you know, not in a traditional sense. You, know, you don't have to work with the space agencies. You can work in all these other other different ways. Um, so Andy, there's been um, a question whether we think there'll be commercial travel from the, um, from the UK to space um, in the future. What are your opinions on that? Um, I, I don't think that's on the cards at the moment. The, um, the, certainly the immediate developments are very small scale rocket launch from, from sites in the sort of Scottish Isles and potentially off the Welsh coast. And as I say the the underwing horizontal launch technology from Cornwall. So that the kind of rockets we're talking about are, are much more in line with those loaf of bread size satellites uh, than they are for for human spaceflight. Uh, so yeah, if if you're looking to take your uh, your holiday in space, then I'm afraid you're probably still launching from the states for the moment. Oh, so a bit more travel for me than if I ever want to go. <laughs> But no, it's really good. And um, it's great that we'll be able to see satellites launching from this country because it's, it's been a long time since, since a rocket has launched um, from the UK. Um, and, you know, the UK are really great at making small satellites as well. So it's playing to our, to our strengths. 
Um, we've been asked whether um, there's a possibility to do research in the space industry if you've got a background in solid mechanics. Um, I don't know who wants to answer that. Maybe Steve or Sarah, do you have an opinion on that? I mean, I, I assume that you would be able to work in the space industry. It's quite, um, you know, diverse and has a lot of different things that you can work on. But Sarah, what's your opinion? So I can't answer this for sure because I, I'm not um, at the high levels of recruiting, but near enough every single process we have on Earth, we still need to think about when we go to Mars on top of all the like the space equipment, all of the like scientific equipment they need to do the job on Mars. So any job here does have a place in the space industry. There are tons of engineers, tons of different people working on what materials to use, how best to construct them and things like that. I think one of the really amazing things about the space industry is the massive variance of people that are in it. There are people from all sorts of backgrounds doing all sorts of things. And it's a really kind of collaborative effort. There's, there's very, there isn't really, it's not just astrophysics. It's not just aerospace engineering. All of the, all of the sciences and like material science and things like that, especially and social science and policy and law all come into how we, how we approach space travel. There's, I think there would be very few kind of backgrounds that don't lend themselves well to interacting in the space agency and space industry in some way. I think finding the opportunities is the difficult part, um, which I sympathize with as well. But yeah, I think kind of all skills are useful in the space industry, definitely. I completely agree with that. It is very, a very inclusive industry. So if any of you listening out there want to work in space, there's definitely a role for you. Just do a bit of research, uh, make some contacts, join events like today, which you've already done, um, and just keep on um, learning more about space. Um, so um, where are we up to in the chat? Okay, so what I wanted to ask um, both yourself, Sara and Steve, um, as scientists, as fellow scientists, um, once we find this life, or if we find this life on Mars, what are our plans with it then? What, what would NASA or the space agencies do with it then? Do we want to recreate this life? Do we want to bring it back and, and have a look at it on Earth? What are, what are our plans? So one of the main principles when we're doing planetary exploration is something called planetary protection. So if there is living life on Mars, we have a duty to that life not to disrupt it, not to destroy its ecosystem. I think it's unlikely that we're going to find large scale living life on Mars today. I hate to say it, but I think it is quite unlikely. If we're to find things like fossilized life or evidence of past life, the idea is that we'd be bringing them back in those samples. But we have to be really careful that we don't disrupt the ecology of potential um, digital habitats and life on Mars if it exists. I don't think NASA are trying to recreate it, but I can't speak for NASA. <laughs> no, I understand. Sorry, sorry, Steve. And just just to add on to what Sarah said as well, if, if we did find life, then it would answer one of the fundamental questions of science. Are we alone in the universe? And if life can exist on or could have um, arisen on Mars or any other planetary body, then then that demonstrates that uh, life is not unique in the universe and, and that will answer one, one of those, those like, difficult questions that science has been seeking to an answer for sort of the last uh, 200 years or so, ever since we looked up into the stars and asked whether we're alone in the universe or not. Yeah, it will be a monumental moment for, for scientists and engineers and, and every, everyone, all humans on the planet, to, you know, to find that there's going to be life um, elsewhere than if um so it's yeah it's it's very exciting though yeah I, I know that there's kind of less chance of us finding it on mars but it would be amazing if we could um so um there's a few other questions so let me run through there's so many thank you all for sending in your questions there's absolutely loads here um, I think we've kind of answered why people need to find signs of life. So I think it's just built into our nature to keep on exploring and looking and, you know, being the only humans or the only life in the universe that we know of. Um, we're just very curious, uh, very curious people. And we just want to know, know more. Um, we've had a, a question about why can we breathe on Earth, but we can't breathe on other planets. So I guess this has got a lot to do with the uh, composition of the atmosphere. Um, and just us not having um, or detecting that much oxygen in other planets. But um, Sarah, I know that you've muted, you've unmuted. So if you want to jump in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, fundamentally, the Earth is really well positioned to provide us with the things that we need, like like a breathable atmosphere. So 
Mars no longer has a magnetic field the way the Earth does, so it's not protected from the sun's radiation in the same way. And we think that stripped away most of the things in the atmosphere that would make it breathable for humans. So it's just a consequence of where they are in the solar system and the kind of processes they've gone through. It's not, um, yeah, it's just kind of like a, a product of the way they've evolved. Um, but it's not, not being able to breathe on Mars or other planets isn't the only issue. Um, I think we've got a question about um, living on Mars. Um, I'm just kind of like, what's difficult about it and how we'd actually do it. And there is so much about the surface of Mars that can get humans to it that is really fundamentally dangerous and difficult. We have that we can't breathe the atmosphere. We don't have access to large scale bodies of water, which are fundamental to us living. Um, and we're trying to find ways to mine out of soils and things like that um, and repurpose it from other things, which is ongoing. And actually there, there are some instruments on board the Perseverance rover that, well, there's one called MOXIE, which is trying to mine oxygen back out of the atmosphere. So it's a really small kind of like technology development um, instrument that's hopefully going to show that that could be scaled up so we could kind of farm oxygen out of the atmosphere for humans, which would be amazing. But even when you take that away, you have the insanely high radiation levels at the surface that we don't really have adequate protection from yet. You have the really low surface pressure, which doesn't match with our bodies. And actually, the surface pressure of Mars is so low. It's about 100 times less than the surface pressure of Earth that the boiling point of water is below our body temperature. And that sounds like a really horrendous thing to have to go through. Wow. And like, I, I would love to be an astronaut. That's my, my dream, my goal in life. And I would love to stand on Mars one day. But it's really, really difficult. There are so many physiological challenges we have to overcome, let alone getting there, let alone getting back, let alone building have. Yeah, it's a huge, complex, complex problem. Yeah, lots of uh, future challenges for our future scientists and engineers out there, most definitely. Um, and I've saw that you'd like to answer the um, the Pluto planet, uh, the Pluto planet, the Pluto questions on the chat, um, if you want to go for that. Yeah, so somebody asked um, if Pluto is a planet or a dwarf planet and who discovered it. So it is a dwarf planet, but even, so I used to think that it was atrocious that it had been demoted from a planet to a dwarf planet. But actually, when you look at Pluto, it doesn't really fit most of the requirements to be a planet. It hasn't cleared its local neighborhood and things like that. And it's actually smaller than some of the asteroids in the asteroid belt that even have their own satellites like Ceres, which is a really cool asteroid. And if you like the sort of stuff, you should definitely go and look into it. Um, and it was discovered by an American astronomer whose name I don't recall. Um, and I think that was in the 1900s or so, the kind of first recorded um, finding of Pluto. But it is a dwarf planet. But I would argue that maybe that's still too generous. Great, thank you for answering that. Sorry to put you on the spot as well. Um, I want to come back to Andy because I'm just very interested in in the RAF's role um, in you know future space um, technology and satellites and communications and all of this type of stuff. So, um, for any of our young people listening now, how would be the best way to get involved in that if that was a career choice of theirs for the future? Um. Thanks, thanks. It, th there's lots of ways to get into to the RAF, to be honest. Um, and depending on your age group, if you have uh, a local air cadet unit, most places do for, for teenagers, I'd encourage you to get involved with that. It's a fantastic organization, does all sorts of stuff um, sort of to do with the Air Force. There's probably the opportunity to get flying. Um, there's certainly a, a big STEM uh sort of thrust in what, what the air cadets do. They do a lot of cyber stuff. They do a lot of coding stuff. So really great way to get started. Um, and actually joining the service, there's, there's several routes. I followed a yeah, fairly traditional one. I did my A-levels, did a degree, joined as an engineer. But we have apprenticeship entries uh, and, and all sorts of ways into it. And then if you don't perhaps want to do it as a full-time career, if you're interested in this you your career takes you into this kind of area anyway then there's always the reserves as well and you can contribute uh, sort of on a few days a year basis so yeah lots of different ways but for for young people find out where your local air cadet unit is and start from there brilliant and i can see in the chat that steve's mentions that he was an air cadet once so steve do you recommend that for any young people listening yeah i would thoroughly recommend joining the air cadets uh, i enjoyed my time um 
uh, when I was a member of the Air Cadets in Trent Wing up in uh, Lincolnshire. Um, I didn't do too much flying. I was more interested in uh, marksmanship and things like that. But it's a, a good standing to sort of join. And you get to learn lots of things about m- sort of the mechanical processes of how aircraft works. And it, um, and it could be a, a good way of sort of figuring out um, whether whether you want to join the RAF and what sort of roles. So initially, I was planning to to join the RAF as a uh, airframe mechanic or a, a uh, aircraft engine engineer, uh, although I got waylaid. <laughs> And that is some, it's one of my regrets that I didn't join any, any sort of cadets when I was younger. Uh, so I, I started learning to fly helicopters a few years ago um, in my ambition to become an astronaut. And um, I just feel like all of that experience would have just been so valuable as a young person to have. So yeah, taking the advice of Steve and Andy, if, um, if any of you are thinking of joining, have a look at where your local centre is and, um, and make sure that you, that you sign up. Um, so I'm just looking through, I don't know if any of you have spotted any questions that you, you're really passionate about answering. Um, if so, go for it. But I think we're, we're kind of coming up to the end now. So possibly one more question um, can be asked or answered. I wanted to follow up. Somebody asked about how oxygen is made. So I think that's probably in response to the mock the instrument. So it, actually, it creates um, oxygen the same way trees do. So it breathes in carbon dioxide and then, and then breathes out oxygen. So kind of like a biomimetic um, way, which is really cool. Nice, thank you for answering that. Um, I, I hadn't realized, yeah, it's just amazing. I've absolutely loved this panel. Um, I don't know about yourselves, whether you've learned from each other, but um, I've really enjoyed um, being on this panel today and hearing more about the things that you do. 